Camille. This film found the divine Garbo in the role of the elegant courtesan known as Camille, who makes the mistake of falling in love. Shakespeare can come back to me when it dies. Tomorrow night. Look. It's dead already. Now. No, it's impossible. Nothing's impossible now. Send those people in the other room. I can't. Then I will. Why, you've never known love to love. Never, when it was unsanctified by marriage, unblessed by children or social ties. I shall love Armand always. And I believe he shall love me always, too. Always. Always. I could kill you for this. I'm not worth killing, Armand. I've loved you as much as I could love. If that wasn't enough, I'm not to blame. Some of the greatest actresses of stage and cinema had played Camille, but when Garbo took the role, she made it hers forever. For movie fans, Camille is Garbo. No one ever looked more beautiful while dying of tuberculosis. George Cukor directed Garbo in Camille. Miss Garbo is very hardworking, very disciplined, she made very few demands, but when she made them, she made them very quietly, and she wanted them listened to. Aside from that, she was most amenable and, uh, and cooperative. If Garbo received awards and nominations, Dietrich at least raked in the dough. In 1936, she was the highest paid woman in the world. Paramount was giving her good money, but not good scripts, and soon Garbo ran into the same trouble. In Conquest, made in 1937, Garbo played the Polish Countess Maria, who becomes Napoleon Bonaparte's mistress. She begs Napoleon, played by Charles Boyer, to free her native land from Russia. The crown would not be unbecoming on that lovely head. I want no other crown than your loving me. I wish mine were as lasting as yours, then. You have given me much more than love, Napoleon Bonaparte. You touched me and gave me life. You lifted me up. The whole world went away from me. I will never know that little world again. Despite the lavish production, Conquest proved as disastrous at the box office as Napoleon's Russian campaign. Dietrich, too, had appeared in some major box office flops. One of them was the Garden of Allah. Garbo had turned down the script, and Marlena regretted not doing the same. In May 1938, the president of the Independent Theater Owners of America published an ad in movie trade papers labeling several big-name stars box office poison, claiming that their tremendous salaries did not reflect in their ticket sales. Among the stars named were Mae West, Katherine Hepburn, Joan Crawford, Greta Garbo, and Marlena Dietrich. Between 1937 and 1939, neither Dietrich nor Garbo made any movies. After being labeled box office poison, Dietrich lost out on a movie she had been slated for, and Paramount declined to renew her contract. Going back to her native land was out of the question. Detesting the Nazis, Marlena had spurned Hitler's offer of making films in Germany. The Nazis responded by banning her movies. Losing the lucrative German market had simply given Paramount another reason to drop her and became an obstacle to other studios in hiring her. It seemed her career was finished. But an offer did come from Universal Studios, who wanted her to play yet another saloon singer, this time in a comedy western. Marlena played the brawling Frenchie in Destry Rides Again, which also starred Jimmy Stewart as the non-violent lawman. The result was another film classic, and Marlena got two more songs in her repertoire. Comedy revived Garbo's career as well. In the Ernst Lubitsch classic, Ninochka, she had the role of a stern agent of the Soviet Union sent to Paris, only to be seduced by love and capitalism. It was her first comedy since the slapstick short she made back in Sweden. Go to bed, little father. We want to be alone. Please. You like me just a little bit? 
Your general appearance is not distasteful. Thank you. The whites of your eyes are clear. Your cornea is excellent. Your cornea is terrific. Surely you feel some slight symptom of the divine passion. A general warmth in the palms of your hands. A strange heaviness in your limbs. A burning of the lips. That isn't thirst, but something a thousand times more tantalizing, more exalting than thirst. You're very talkative. Her performance earned her a fourth Academy Award nomination for Best Actress. Destry Rides Again might easily have been called Dietrich Rides Again as the rough-and-tumble western revitalized her career. In Seven Sinners, she was cast along with the only actor who seemed more manly than her, John Wayne. Good night. Not yet. Oh, I must. Because at this time of the night, I have no sense. No sense this time of night. You were accused of... Of inciting and exciting a riot, of being a public nuisance. I make rough seas. I set the jungle on fire. I'm a bad influence. You don't want to make a scene here, do you? No, I don't want to make a scene. Not for anything in the world. Wayne's career had also just revived, thanks to the movie Stagecoach. When Dietrich first met Wayne, she walked right past him, then looked back at him and whispered, Oh, Daddy, buy me that. Thus began an intense three-year affair between Wayne and Dietrich. Wayne called Marlena the most intriguing woman I've ever known. Marlena Dietrich, Randolph Scott, John Wayne, in a drama bold as the screen can give. From now on, things are going to be run my way, and you can start adjusting yourself to that idea. And that's my way. Like it? The pair re-teamed in The Spoilers, a remake of the classic tale of the Yukon Gold Rush. This rousing, brawling picture was another box office hit. But while Marlena was having an affair with the Duke, she continued to be seen in public with author A. Marquet, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., George Raft, Frank Sinatra, and Jean Gobbin, flaunting her old, new, and future love affairs. In Pittsburgh, Dietrich, Wayne, and Randolph Scott formed a love triangle set in the coal and steel industries. But Pittsburgh found the relationship between Wayne and Dietrich at an end, on and off screen. At the same time, the Destry revival faltered for Dietrich. I'm your kind of guy, see? And you're my kind of gal. We were cut from the same chunk. Yeah. Some dirt and smoke. Maybe that's what you want. I've got other plans. Marriage with that crowd is a business like everything else. Oh, come on, Hunky. You got the wrong slant. You got to see this thing the right way. In the many ups and downs of her career, she again found her box office appeal plummeting as her latest movies bombed. Garbo was not faring any better. Outside of love, everything else seems to be a waste of time. I like men. Her follow-up to Ninochka was a dual role in Two-Faced Woman. It suffered from rewrites and struggles with the censors, and when released, critics trashed it, while audiences ignored it. Karen, please don't do that. It shocks me. Well, it didn't shock you when I was Catherine, did it? You, Catherine? My dear, you're having delusions of grandeur. You prosaic, respectable ski instructor. I am not respectable. Don't talk to me like that. Oh, I couldn't take money from you. Why not? That's immoral. You have very strange ideas of morality. I always live by my own talents. I never take money from relatives. Only from strangers. It's my code. Why, of all the men in the world, did fate bring me here and make me fall in love with my own sister's husband? The small world. It's too crowded for me. Not yet. 
After Two-Faced Woman, Garbo left the movies, never to return. Like Queen Christina, Garbo abdicated her stardom for reasons she never explained. Perhaps it was the poor reception of her last film, or perhaps she felt she was getting older, and the style of the film she felt most comfortable with had become old-fashioned. Much of Garbo's appeal was international, and world affairs intruded on her career. The Second World War cut off the lucrative foreign market where Garbo's films made the most money, and that may also have influenced her dramatic decision. The war affected Marlena as well, but in an entirely different way. Dietrich campaigned vigorously for the Allied war effort, making anti-Nazi radio broadcasts in German. I had hardly thought it possible that entertainment of such high caliber could be presented out here in the field. I wish to add my respect and admiration along with General Clark and Irving Berlin to the men and women of the Fifth Army. Most of all, Dietrich toured with the USO shows on the battlefront, becoming what she often portrayed in the movies, a singer entertaining soldiers. For her efforts, she was awarded the Congressional Medal of Freedom and France's Legion of Honor. As befitting someone from a country as neutral as Sweden, Greta Garbo remained non-committal and out of the public eye. Dietrich made only a couple of movies during the war years. In my palace, there is a corner I call the Garden of the Stars. I like that. There I sat night after night with my astrologers. They're a stupid lot. They don't know anything about women. But you do, my prince. There never was another woman in the world I couldn't forget but you. Kismet put the Prussian diva into Middle Eastern garb for her one picture with Garbo studio, MGM. Ronald Coleman starred as an Arab adventurer and Dietrich as the Grand Vizier's mistress, with her famous legs painted gold despite the danger of lead poisoning. Unfortunately, the censors cracked down on Dietrich's exotic dance, which was the highlight of the movie. You are young, and you are strong, and you are my beautiful man. Please, your hands. Couldn't you arrange to sit on them or something? <laughs> Golden Earring starred Ray Milland on a commando mission behind enemy lines during World War II. Dietrich played a gypsy woman who aids him, and they fall in love. But for all the romance on the screen, in reality, Milland and Dietrich couldn't stand each other. Now get this clear once and for all. You simply must learn to behave like a good woman. But I am good woman. I just want to kiss you, little. Dietrich thought Milland was a pompous prig, and what he thought of her is unrepeatable. Despite the rift, the movie proved a big success, again restoring Dietrich's fortune. Her popularity was undiminished in 1948, when her daughter, sometime actress Maria, married and gave birth to a son. Fan magazines declared Marlena the most glamorous grandmother in the world. Yet the fact she was a grandmother must have reminded her of the march of time, especially as she was cast opposite younger women.